Chapter 6 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams, Chapter 6. It was in this winter, after his coming to the Grey Street, that Lucian first experienced the pains of desolation. He had all his life known the delights of solitude, and had acquired that habit of mind which makes a man find rich company on the bare hillside, and leads him into the heart of the wood to meditate by the dark water-pools. But now, in the blank interval when he was forced to shut up his desk, the sense of loneliness overwhelmed him and filled him with unutterable melancholy. On such days he carried about with him an unceasing gnawing torment in his breast, the anguish of the empty page awaiting him in his bureau, and the knowledge that it was worse than useless to attempt the work. He had fallen into the habit of always using this phrase, the work, to denote the adventure of literature. It had grown in his mind to all the austere and grave significance of the great work on the lips of the alchemists. It included every trifling and laborious page, and the vague, magnificent fancies that sometimes hovered below him. All else had become mere by-play, unimportant, trivial. The work was the end, and the means and the food of his life. It raised him up in the morning to renew the struggle. It was the symbol which charmed him as he lay down at night. All through the hours of toil at the bureau he was enchanted, and when he went out and explored the unknown coasts the one thought allured him, and was the colored glass between his eyes and the world. Then, as he drew nearer home, his steps would quicken, and the more weary and gray the walk, the more he rejoiced as he thought of his hermitage and of the curious difficulties that awaited him there. But when, suddenly and without warning, the faculty disappeared, when his mind seemed a hopeless waste from which nothing could arise, then he became subject to a misery so piteous that the barbarians themselves would have been sorry for him. He had known some foretaste of these bitter and inexpressible griefs in the old country days, but then he had immediately taken refuge in the hills. He had rushed to the dark woods to an anodyne, letting his heart drink in all the wonder and magic of the wild land. Now, in these days of January, in the suburban street, there was no such refuge. He had been working steadily for some weeks well enough satisfied on the whole with the daily progress, glad to awake in the morning and to read over what he had written on the night before. The new year opened with faint and heavy weather and a breathless silence in the air, but in a few days the great frost set in. Soon the streets began to suggest the appearance of a beleaguered city. The silence that had preceded the frost deepened, and the mist hung over the earth like a dense white smoke. Night after night the cold increased, and people seemed unwilling to go abroad, till even the main thoroughfares were empty and deserted, as if the inhabitants were lying close in hiding. It was at this dismal time that Lucian found himself reduced to impotence. There was a sudden break in his thought, and when he rode on valiantly, hoping against hope, he only grew more aghast on the discovery of the imbecilities he had committed to paper. He ground his teeth together and persevered, sick at heart, feeling as if all the world were fallen from under his feet, driving his pen on mechanically till he was overwhelmed. He saw the stuff he had done, without veil or possible concealment, a lamentable and wretched sheaf of verbiage. Worse, it seemed, than the efforts of his boyhood. He was no longer tautological he avoided tautology with the infernal art of a leader-writer, filling his windbags and mincing words as if he had been a trained journalist on the staff of the Daily Post. There seemed all the matter of an insufferable tragedy in these thoughts, that his patient and enduring toil was in vain, that practice went for nothing, and that he had wasted the labor of Milton to accomplish the tenth rate. Unhappily, he could not give in. The longing, the fury for the work burnt within him like a burning fire. He lifted up his eyes in despair. It was then, while he knew that no one could help him, that he languished for help. 
and then, though he was aware that no comfort was possible, he fervently wished to be comforted. The only friend he had was his father, and he knew that his father would not even understand his distress. For him, always, the printed book was the beginning and end of literature. The agony of the Maker, his despair and sickness, were as accursed as the pains of labor. He was ready to read and admire the work of the great smith, but he did not wish to hear of the period when the great smith had writhed and twisted like a scotched worm, only hoping to be put out of his misery, to go mad or die, to escape somehow from the bitter pains. And Lucian knew no one else. Now and then he read in the paper the fame of the great literatures, the gypsies who were entertaining the Prince of Wales, the jolly beggars were dining with the Lord Mayor, the old mumpers were mingling amicably and gorgeously with the leading members of the Stock Exchange. He was so unfortunate as to know none of these gentlemen, but it hardly seemed likely that they could have done much for him in any case. Indeed, in his heart, he was certain that help and comfort from without were in the nature of things utterly impossible. His ruin and grief were within, and only his own assistance could avail. He tried to reassure himself, to believe that his torments were a proof of his vocation, that the facility of the novelist who stood six years deep in contracts to produce romances was a thing wholly undesirable, but all the while he longed for but a drop of that inexhaustible fluency which he professed to despise. He drove himself out from that dreary contemplation of the white paper and the idle pen. He went into the frozen and deserted streets, hoping that he might pluck the burning coal from his heart. But the fire was not quenched. As he walked furiously along the grim iron roads, he fancied that those persons who passed him cheerfully on their way to friends and friendly hearths shrank from him into the mists as they went by. Lucian imagined that the fire of his torment and anguish must in some way glow visibly about him. He moved, perhaps, in a nimbus that proclaimed the blackness and the flames within. He knew, of course, that in misery he had grown delirious, that the well-coated, smooth-hatted personages who loomed out of the fog upon him were in reality shuddering only with cold. But in spite of common sense, he still conceived that he saw on their faces an evident horror and disgust, and something of the repugnance that one feels at the sight of a venomous snake, half-killed, trailing its bleeding vileness out of sight. By design Lucian tried to make for remote and desolate places, and yet, when he had succeeded in touching on the open country, and knew that the icy shadow hovering through the mist was a field, he longed for some sound and murmur of life, and turned again to roads where pale lamps were glimmering, and the dancing flame of firelight shone across the frozen shrubs. And the sight of these homely fires, the thought of affection and consolation waiting by them, stung him the more sharply, perhaps because of the contrast with his own chills and weariness and helpless sickness, and chiefly because he knew that he had long closed an everlasting door between his heart and such felicities. If those within had come out and had called him by his name to enter and be comforted, it would have been quite unavailing, since between them and him there was a great gulf fixed. Perhaps for the first time he realized that he had lost the art of humanity forever. He had thought, when he closed his ears to the wood whisper and changed the fawn singing for the murmur of the streets, the black pools for the shadows and amber light of London, that he had put off the old life and had turned his soul to healthy activities, but the truth was that he had merely exchanged one drug for another. He could not be human and he wondered whether there were some drop of the fairy blood in his body that made him foreign and a stranger in the world. He did not surrender to desolation without repeated struggles. He strove to allure himself to his desk by the promise of some easy task. He would not attempt invention, but he had memoranda and rough jottings of ideas in his notebooks, and he would merely amplify the suggestions ready to his hand.' 
But it was hopeless. Again and again it was hopeless. As he read over his notes, trusting that he would find some hint that might light up the dead fires, and kindle again that pure flame of enthusiasm, he found how desperately his fortune had fallen. He could see no light, no color in the lines he had scribbled with eager, trembling fingers. He remembered how splendid all these things had been when he wrote them down, but now they were meaningless, faded into gray. The few words he had dashed onto the paper, enraptured at the thought of the happy hours they promised, had become mere jargon, and when he understood the idea it seemed foolish, dull, unoriginal. He discovered something at last that appeared to have a grain of promise, and determined to do his best to put it into shape, but the first paragraph appalled him. It might have been written by an unintelligent schoolboy. He tore the paper in pieces, and shut and locked his desk, heavy despair sinking like lead into his heart. For the rest of that day he lay motionless on the bed, smoking pipe after pipe in the hope of stupefying himself with tobacco fumes. The air in the room became blue and thick with smoke. It was bitterly cold, and he wrapped himself up in his greatcoat and drew the counterpane over him. The night came on, and the window darkened, and at last he fell asleep. He renewed the effort at intervals, only to plunge deeper into misery. He felt the approaches of madness, and knew that his only hope was to walk till he was physically exhausted, so that he might come home almost fainting with fatigue, but ready to fall asleep the moment he got into bed. He passed the mornings in a kind of torpor, endeavoring to avoid thought, to occupy his mind with the pattern of the paper, with the advertisements at the end of a book, with the curious grayness of the light that glimmered through the mist into his room with the muffled voices that rumbled now and then from the street. He tried to make out the design that had once colored the faded carpet on the floor, and wondered about the dead artist in Japan, the adorner of his bureau. He speculated as to what his thoughts had been as he inserted the rainbow mother-of-pearl and made that great flight of shining birds, dipping their wings as they rose from the reeds, or how he had conceived the lacquer dragons in red gold, and the fantastic houses and the garden of peach trees. But sooner or later the oppression of his grief returned, the loud shriek and clang of the garden gate, the warning bell of some passing bicyclist steering through the fog, the noise of his pipe falling to the floor, would suddenly waken him to the sense of misery. He knew that it was time to go out. He could not bear to sit still and suffer. Sometimes he cut a slice of bread and put it in his pocket. Sometimes he trusted to the chance of finding a public house, where he could have a sandwich and a glass of beer. He turned always from the main streets and lost himself in the intricate suburban byways, willing to be engulfed in the infinite whiteness of the mist. The roads had stiffened into iron ridges. The fences and trees were glittering with frost crystals. Everything was of strange and altered aspect. Lucian walked on and on through the maze, now in a circle of shadowy villas, awful as the buried streets of Herculaneum, now in lanes dipping onto open country that led him past great elm trees whose white boughs were all still, and past the bitter lonely fields where the mist seemed to fade away into gray darkness. As he wandered along these unfamiliar and ghastly paths, he became the more convinced of his utter remoteness from all humanity. He allowed that grotesque suggestion of there being something visibly amiss in his outer appearance to grow upon him, and often he looked with a horrible expectation into the faces of those who passed by, afraid lest his own senses gave him false intelligence and that he had really assumed some frightful and revolting shape. It was curious that, partly by his own fault, and largely, no doubt through the operation of mere coincidence, he was once or twice strongly confirmed in this fantastic delusion. He came one day into a lonely and unfrequented byway, a country lane falling into ruin but still fringed with elms that had formed an avenue leading to the old manor-house. 
It was now the road of communication between two far outlying suburbs, and on these winter nights lay as black, dreary, and desolate as a mountain track. Soon after the frost began, a gentleman had been set upon in this lane as he picked his way between the corner where the bus had set him down and his home where the fire was blazing, and his wife watched the clock. He was stumbling uncertainly through the gloom, growing a little nervous because the walk seemed so long, and peering anxiously for the lamp at the end of his street, when the two footpads rushed at him out of the fog. One caught him from behind, the other struck him with a heavy bludgeon, and as he lay senseless they robbed him of his watch and money, and vanished across the fields. The next morning all the suburb rang with the story. The unfortunate merchant had been grievously hurt, and wives watched their husbands go out in the morning with sickening apprehension, not knowing what might happen at night. Lucian, of course, was ignorant of all these rumors, and struck into the gloomy by-road without caring where he was or whither the way would lead him. He had been driven out that day, as with whips, Another hopeless attempt to return to the work had agonized him, and existence seemed an intolerable pain. As he entered the deeper gloom, where the fog hung heavily, he began, half-consciously, to gesticulate. He felt convulsed with torment and shame, and it was a sorry relief to clench his nails into his palm and strike the air as he stumbled heavily along, bruising his feet against the frozen ruts and ridges. His impotence was hideous, he said to himself, and he cursed himself and his life, breaking out into a loud oath and stamping on the ground. Suddenly he was shocked at a scream of terror. It seemed in his very ear, and looking up he saw for a moment a woman gazing at him out of the mist, her features distorted and stiff with fear. A momentary convulsion twitched her arms into the ugly mimicry of a beckoning gesture, and she turned and ran for dear life, howling like a beast. Lucian still stood in the road while the woman's cries grew faint and died away. His heart was chilled within him as the significance of this strange incident became clear. He remembered nothing of his violent gestures. He had not known at the time that he had sworn out loud, or that he was grinding his teeth with impotent rage. He only thought of that ringing scream, of the horrible fear on the white face that had looked upon him, of the woman's headlong flight from his presence. He stood trembling and shuddering, and in a little while he was feeling his face, searching for some loathsome mark, for the stigmata of evil branding his forehead. He staggered homewards like a drunken man, and when he came into the Uxbridge Road some children saw him and called after him as he swayed and caught at the lamppost. When he got to his room he sat down at first in the dark. He did not dare to light the gas. Everything in the room was indistinct, but he shut his eyes as he passed the dressing-table, and sat in a corner, his face turned to the wall. And when at last he gathered courage and the flame leapt hissing from the jet, he crept piteously towards the glass, and ducked his head, crouching miserably, and struggling with his terrors before he could look at his own image. To the best of his power he tried to deliver himself from these more grotesque fantasies. He assured himself that there was nothing terrific in his countenance but sadness, that his face was like the face of other men. Yet he could not forget that reflection he had seen in the woman's eyes, how the surest mirrors had shown him a horrible dread her soul itself quailing and shuddering at an awful sight. Her scream rang and rang in his ears. She had fled away from him as if he offered some fate darker than death. He looked again and again into the glass, tortured by a hideous uncertainty. His senses told him there was nothing amiss, yet he had a proof, and yet, as he peered most earnestly, there was, it seemed, something strange and not altogether usual in the expression of the eyes. Perhaps it might be the unsteady flare of the gas, or perhaps a flaw in the cheap looking-glass, that gave some slight distortion to the image. He walked briskly up and down the room and tried to gaze steadily, indifferently, into his own face. 
he would not allow himself to be misguided by a word. When he had pronounced himself incapable of humanity, he had only meant that he could not enjoy the simple things of common life. A man was not necessarily monstrous, merely because he did not appreciate high tea, a quiet chat about the neighbors, and a happy, noisy evening with the children. But with what message, then, did he appear charged that the woman's mouth grew so stark? Her hands had jerked up as if they had been pulled with frantic wires. She seemed for the instant like a horrible puppet. Her scream was a thing from the nocturnal Sabbath. He lit a candle and held it close up to the glass, so that his own face glared white at him and the reflection of the room became an indistinct darkness. He saw nothing but the candle flame and his own shining eyes, and surely they were not as the eyes of common men. As he put down the light, a sudden suggestion entered his mind, and he drew a quick breath, amazed at the thought. He hardly knew whether to rejoice or to shudder, for the thought he conceived was this, that he had mistaken all the circumstances of the adventure, and had perhaps repulsed a sister who would have welcomed him to the Sabbath. He lay awake all night, turning from one dreary and frightful thought to the other, scarcely dozing for a few hours when the dawn came. He tried for a moment to argue with himself when he got up. Knowing that his true life was locked up in the bureau, he made a desperate attempt to drive the phantoms and hideous shapes from his mind. He was assured that his salvation was in the work, and he drew the key from his pocket and made as if he would have opened the desk. But the nausea, the remembrances of repeated and utter failure, were too powerful. For many days he hung about the manor lane, half dreading, half desiring another meeting, and he swore he would not again mistake the cry of rapture, nor repulse the arms extended in a frenzy of delight. In those days he dreamed of some dark place where they might celebrate and make the marriage of the Sabbath, with such rites as he had dared to imagine. It was, perhaps, only the shock of a letter from his father that rescued him from these evident approaches to madness. Mr. Taylor wrote how they had missed him at Christmas, how the farmers had inquired after him of the homely familiar things that recalled his boyhood, his mother's voice, the friendly fireside, and the good old fashions that had nurtured him. He remembered that he had once been a boy, loving the cake and puddings and the radiant holly and all the seventeenth-century mirth that lingered on in the ancient farmhouses. And there came to him the more holy memory of Mass on Christmas morning. How sweet the dark and frosty earth had smelt as he walked beside his mother down the winding lane. And from the stile near the church they had seen the world glimmering to the dawn, and the wandering lanterns advancing across the fields. Then he had come into the church and seen it shining with candles and holly, and his father, in pure vestments of white linen, sang the longing music of the liturgy at the altar, and the people answered him till the sun rose with the grave notes of the paternoster and a red beam stole through the chancel window. The worst horror left him as he recalled the memory of these dear and holy things. He cast away the frightful fancy that the scream he had heard was a shriek of joy, that the arms, rigidly jerked out, invited him to an embrace. Indeed, the thought that he had longed for such an obscene illusion, that he had gloated over the recollection of that stark mouth, filled him with disgust. He resolved that his senses were deceived, that he had neither seen nor heard, but had for a moment externalized his own slumbering and morbid dreams. It was perhaps necessary that he should be wretched, that his efforts should be discouraged, but he would not yield utterly to madness. Yet when he went abroad with such good resolutions, it was hard to resist an influence that seemed to come from without and within. He did not know it, but people were everywhere talking of the great frost, of the fog that lay heavy on London, making the streets dark and terrible, of strange birds that came fluttering about the windows in the silent squares, 
The Thames rolled out duskily, bearing down the jarring ice blocks, and as one looked on the black water from the bridges, it was like a river in a northern tale. To Lucian it all seemed mythical, of the same substance as his own fantastical thoughts. He rarely saw a newspaper and did not follow from day to day the systematic readings of the thermometer, the reports of ice fairs, of coaches driven across the river at Hampton, of the skating on the fens, and hence the iron roads, the beleaguered silence, and the heavy folds of mist appeared as amazing as a picture, significant, appalling. He could not look out and see a common suburban street foggy and dull, nor think of the inhabitants as at work or sitting cheerfully eating nuts about their fires. He saw a vision of gray road vanishing, of dim houses all empty and deserted, and the silence seemed eternal. And when he went out and passed through street after street, all void by the vague shapes of houses that appeared for a moment and were then instantly swallowed up, it seemed to him as if he had strayed into a city that had suffered some inconceivable doom, that he alone wandered where myriads had once dwelt. It was a town as great as Babylon, terrible as Rome, marvelous as lost Atlantis, set in the midst of a white wilderness surrounded by waste places. It was impossible to escape from it. If he skulked between hedges and crept away beyond the frozen pools, presently the serried stony lines confronted him like an army, and far and far they swept away into the night, as some fabled wall that guards an empire in the vast dim east. Or in that distorting medium of the mist, changing all things, he imagined that he trod an infinite desolate plain, abandoned from ages, but circled and encircled with dolmen and men here that loomed out at him gigantic, terrible. All London was one gray temple of an awful rite, ring within ring of wizard stones circled about some central place. Every circle was an initiation, every initiation eternal loss. Or perhaps he was astray forever in a land of gray rocks. He had seen the light of home, the flicker of the fire on the walls. Close at hand, it seemed, was the open door, and he had heard dear voices calling to him across the gloom, but he had just missed the path. The lamps vanished, the voices sounded thin and died away, and yet he knew that those within were waiting, that they could not bear to close the door, but waited, calling his name, while he had missed the way and wandered in the pathless desert of the gray rocks. Fantastic, hideous, they beset him wherever he turned, piled up into strange shapes, pricked with sharp peaks, assuming the appearance of goblin towers, swelling into a vague dome like a fairy wrath, huge and terrible. And as one dream faded into another, so these last fancies were perhaps the most tormenting and persistent. The rocky avenues became the camp and fortalice of some half-human, malignant race, who swarmed in hiding, ready to bury him away into the heart of their horrible hills. It was awful to think that all his goings were surrounded, that in the darkness he was watched and surveyed, that every step but led him deeper and deeper into the labyrinth. When, of an evening, he was secure in his room, the blind drawn down and the gas flaring, he made vigorous efforts towards sanity. It was not of his free will that he allowed terror to overmaster him, and he desired nothing better than a placid and harmless life, full of work and clear thinking. He knew that he deluded himself with imagination, that he had been walking through London suburbs and not through pandemonium, and that if he could but unlock his bureau all those ugly forms would be resolved into the mist. But it was hard to say if he consoled himself effectually with such reflections, for the return to common sense meant also the return to the sharp pangs of defeat. It recalled him to the bitter theme of his own inefficiency to the thought that he only desired one thing of life and that this was denied him. He was willing to endure the austerities of a monk in a severe cloister, to suffer cold, to be hungry, to be lonely and friendless, 
to forbear all the consolation of friendly speech, and to be glad of all these things if only he might be allowed to illuminate the manuscript in quietness. It seemed a hideous, insufferable cruelty that he should so fervently desire that which he could never gain. He was led back to the old conclusion. He had lost the sense of humanity. He was wretched because he was an alien and a stranger amongst citizens. It seemed probable that the enthusiasm of literature, as he understood it, the fervent desire for the fine art, had in it something of the inhuman, and dissevered the enthusiast from his fellow creatures. It was possible that the barbarian suspected as much, that by some slow process of rumination he had arrived at his fixed and inveterate impression, by no means a clear reason conviction. The average Philistine, if pressed for the reasons of his dislike, would either become inarticulate, ejaculating fa and pa like an old-fashioned Scots magazine, or else he would give some imaginary and absurd reason, alleging that all literary men are poor, that composers never cut their hair, that painters were rarely public schoolmen, that sculptors couldn't ride straight to hounds to save their lives. But clearly these imbecilities were mere afterthoughts. The average man hated the artist from a deep, instinctive dread of all that was strange, uncanny, alien to his nature. He gibbered, uttered his harsh, semi-bestial fa, and dismissed Keats to his gallipots from much the same motives as usually impelled the black savages to dismiss the white man on an even longer journey. Lucian was not especially interested in this hatred of the barbarian for the maker, except from this point, that it confirmed him in his belief that the love of art dissociated the man from the race. One touch of art made the whole world alien, but surely miseries of the civilized man cast amongst savages were not so much caused by dread of their ferocity as by the terror of his own thoughts. He would perhaps in his last despair leave his retreat and go forth to perish at their hands, so that he might at least die in company, and hear the sound of speech before death. And Lucian felt most keenly that, in his case, there was a double curse. He was as isolated as Keats and as inarticulate as his reviewers. The consolation of the work had failed him and he was suspended in the void between two worlds. It was no doubt the composite effect of his failures, his loneliness of soul, and solitude of life, that had made him invest those common streets with such grim and persistent terrors. He had perhaps yielded to a temptation without knowing that he had been tempted, and in the manner of De Quincey had chosen the subtle in exchange for the more tangible pains. Unconsciously, but still of free will, he had preferred the splendor and the gloom of a malignant vision before his corporal pains, before the hard reality of his own impotence. It was better to dwell in vague melancholy, to stray in the forsaken streets of a city doomed from ages, to wander amidst forlorn and desperate rocks, than to awake to a gnawing and ignoble torment to confess that a house of business would have been more suitable and more practical, that he had promised what he could never perform. Even as he struggled to beat back the phantasmagoria of the mist, and resolved that he would no longer make all the streets a stage of apparitions, he hardly realized what he had done, or that the ghosts he had called might depart and return again. He continued his long walks, always with the object of producing a physical weariness and exhaustion that would enable him to sleep of nights. But even when he saw the foggy and deserted avenues in their proper shape, and allowed his eyes to catch the pale glimmer of the lamps and the dancing flame of the firelight, he could not rid himself of the impression that he stood afar off, that between those hearths and himself there was a great gulf fixed. As he paced down the footpath, he could often see plainly across the frozen shrubs into the homely and cheerful rooms. Sometimes, late in the evening, he caught a passing glimpse of the family at tea, 
father, mother, and children laughing and talking together, well pleased with each other's company. Sometimes a wife or a child was standing by the garden gate, peering anxiously through the fog, and the sight of it all, all the little details, the hideous but comfortable armchairs turned ready to the fire, maroon-red curtains being drawn close to shut out the ugly night, the sudden blaze and illumination as the fire was poked up so that it might be cheerful for father. These trivial and common things were acutely significant. They brought back to him the image of a dead boy, himself. They recalled the shabby old parlor in the country, with its shabby old furniture and fading carpet, and renewed a whole atmosphere of affection and homely comfort. His mother would walk to the end of the drive and look out for him when he was late, wandering then about the dark woodlands. On winter evenings she would make the fire blaze and have his slippers warming by the hearth, and there was probably buttered toast as a treat. He dwelt on all these insignificant, petty circumstances, on the genial glow and light after the muddy winter lanes, on the relish of the buttered toast and the smell of the hot tea, on the two old cats curled fast asleep before the fender, and made them instruments of exquisite pain and regret. Each of these strange houses that he passed was identified in his mind with his own vanished home. All was prepared and ready as in the old days, but he was shut out, judged and condemned to wander in the frozen mist with weary feet, anguished and forlorn. And they that would pass from within to help him could not, neither could he pass to them. Again, for the hundredth time, he came back to the sentence. He could not gain the art of letters, and he had lost the art of humanity. He saw the vanity of all his thoughts. He was an ascetic, caring nothing for warmth and cheerfulness and the small comforts of life, and yet he allowed his mind to dwell on such things. If one of those passers-by, who walked briskly, eager for home, should have pitied him by some miracle and asked him to come in, it would have been worse than useless. Yet he longed for pleasures that he could not have enjoyed. It was as if he were come to a place of torment, where they who could not drink longed for water, where they who could feel no warmth shuddered in the eternal cold. He was oppressed by the grim conceit that he himself still slept within the matted thicket, imprisoned by the green bastions of the Roman fort. He had never come out, but a changeling had gone down the hill, and now stirred about the earth. Beset by such ingenious terrors, it was not wonderful that outward events and common incidents should abet his fancies. He had succeeded one day in escaping from the mesh of the streets, and fell on a rough and narrow lane that stole into a little valley. For the moment he was in a somewhat happier mood. The afternoon sun glowed through the rolling mist and the air grew clearer. He saw quiet and peaceful fields, and a wood descending in a gentle slope from an old farmstead of warm red brick. The farmer was driving the slow cattle home from the hill and his loud hello to his dog came across the land a cheerful mellow note. From another side a cart was approaching the clustered barns, hesitating, pausing while the great horses rested, and then starting again into lazy motion. In the well of the valley a wandering line of bushes showed where a brook crept in and out amongst the meadows, and as Lucian stood lingering on the bridge, a soft and idle breath ruffled through the boughs of a great elm. He felt soothed, as by calm music, and wondered whether it would not be better for him to live in some such quiet place, within reach of the streets and yet remote from them. It seemed a refuge for still thoughts. He could imagine himself sitting at rest beneath the black yew tree in the farm garden, at the close of a summer day he had almost determined that he would knock at the door and ask if they would take him as a lodger, when he saw a child running towards him down the lane. It was a little girl, with bright curls tossing about her head, and as she came on the sunlight glowed upon her, 
illuminating her brick-red frock and the yellow king-cups in her hat. She had run with her eyes on the ground, chirping and laughing to herself, and did not see Lucian till she was quite near him. She started and glanced into his eyes for a moment and began to cry. He stretched out his hand and she ran from him screaming, frightened, no doubt, by what was to her a sudden and strange apparition. He turned back towards London and the mist folded him in its thick darkness, for on that evening it was tinged with black. It was only by the intensest strain of resolution that he did not yield utterly to the poisonous anodyne which was always at hand. It had been a difficult struggle to escape from the mesh of the hills, from the music of the fawns, and even now he was drawn by the memory of those old allurements. But he felt that here, in his loneliness, he was in greater danger and beset by a blacker magic. Horrible fancies rushed wantonly into his mind. He was not only ready to believe that something in his soul sent a shudder through all that was simple and innocent, but he came trembling home one Saturday night, believing, or half-believing, that he was in communion with evil. He had passed through the clamorous and blatant crowd of the high street, where, as one climbed the hill, the shops seemed all aflame and the black night air glowed with the flaring gas-jets and the naphtha lamps hissing and wavering before the February wind. Voices, raucous, clamant, abominable, were belched out of the blazing public-houses as the doors swung to and fro, and above these doors were hideous brassy lamps, very slowly swinging in a violent blast of air, so that they might have been infernal thuribles, sensing the people. Some man was calling his wares in one long continuous shriek that never stopped or paused, and as a respond a deeper, louder voice roared to him from across the road. An Italian whirled the handle of his piano organ in a fury, and a ring of imps danced mad figures around him, danced and flung up their legs till the rags dropped from some of them, and they still danced on. A flare of naphtha, burning with a rushing noise, threw a light on one point of the circle, and Lucian watched a lank girl of fifteen as she came round and round to the flash. She was quite drunk and had kicked her petticoats away, and the crowd howled laughter and applause at her. Her black hair poured down and leapt on her scarlet bodice. She sprang and leapt around the ring, laughing in a bacchic frenzy and led the orgy to triumph. People were crossing to and fro, jostling against each other, swarming about certain shops and stalls in a dense dark mass that quivered and sent out feelers, as if it were one writhing organism. A little farther a group of young men, arm in arm, were marching down the roadway chanting some music-hall verse in full chorus, so that it sounded like plain song. An impossible hubbub, a hum of voices, angry as swarming bees, the squeals of five or six girls who ran in and out and dived up dark passages and darted back into the crowd. All these mingled together till his ears quivered. A young fellow was playing the concertina, and he touched the keys with such slow fingers that the tune wailed solemn into a dirge but there was nothing so strange as the burst of sound that swelled out when the public-house doors were opened. He walked amongst these people, looked at their faces, and looked at the children amongst them. He had come out thinking that he would see the English working class, the best-behaved and best-tempered crowd in the world, enjoying the simple pleasure of the Saturday night shopping. Mother bought the joint for Sunday's dinner, and perhaps a pair of boots for father. Father had an honest glass of beer, and the children were given bags of sweets, and then all these worthy people went decently home to their well-earned rest. De Quincey had enjoyed the sight in his day, and had studied the rise and fall of onions and potatoes. Lucian, indeed, had desired to take these simple emotions as an opiate, to forget the fine fret and fantastic trouble of his own existence in plain things and the palpable joy of rest after labor.'
he was only afraid lest he should be too sharply reproached by the sight of these men who fought bravely year after year against starvation, who knew nothing of intricate and imagined grief, but only the weariness of relentless labor, of the long battle for their wives and children. It would be pathetic, he thought, to see them content with so little, brightened by the expectation of a day's rest and a good dinner, forced even then to reckon every penny and to make their children laugh with halfpence. Either he would be ashamed before so much content, or else he would be again touched by the sense of his inhumanity, which could take no interest in the common things of life. But still he went to be at least taken out of himself, to be forced to look at another side of the world, so that he might perhaps forget a little while his own sorrows. He was fascinated by what he saw and heard. He wondered whether de Quincey also had seen the same spectacle, and had concealed his impressions out of reverence for the average reader. Here there were no simple joys of honest toilers, but wonderful orgies that drew out his heart to horrible music. At first the violence of sound and sight had overwhelmed him. The lights flaring in the night wind, the array of naphtha lamps, the black shadows, the roar of voices. The dance about the piano organ had been the first sign of an inner meaning, and the face of the dark girl as she came round and round to the flame had been amazing in its utter furious abandon. And what songs they were singing all around him! and what terrible words rang out, only to excite peals of laughter. In the public houses, the workmen's wives, the wives of small tradesmen, decently dressed in black, were drinking their faces to a flaming red, and urging their husbands to drink more. Beautiful young women, flushed and laughing, put their arms round the men's necks and kissed them, and then held up the glass to their lips. In the dark corners, at the openings of side streets, the children were talking together, instructing each other, whispering what they had seen. A boy of fifteen was plying a girl of twelve with whiskey, and presently they crept away. Lucian passed them as they turned to go, and both looked at him. The boy laughed, and the girl smiled quietly. It was, above all, in the faces around him that he saw the most astounding things— the Bacchic fury unveiled and unashamed. To his eyes it seemed as if these revelers recognized him as a fellow, and smiled up in his face, aware that he was in the secret. Every instinct of religion, of civilization even, was swept away. They gazed at one another and at him, absolved of all scruples, children of the earth and nothing more. Now and then a couple detached themselves from the swarm, and went away into the darkness, answering the jeers and laughter of their friends as they vanished. On the edge of the pavement, not far from where he was standing, Lucian noticed a tall and lovely young woman who seemed to be alone. She was in the full light of a naphtha flame, and her bronze hair and flushed cheeks shone illuminate as she viewed the orgy. She had dark brown eyes and a strange look as of an old picture in her face, and her eyes brightened with an urgent gleam. He saw the revelers nudging each other and glancing at her, and two or three young men went up and asked her to come for a walk. She shook her head and said, No, thank you, again and again, and seemed as if she were looking for somebody in the crowd. I'm expecting a friend, she said at last to a man who proposed a drink and a walk afterwards, and Lucian wondered what kind of friend would ultimately appear. Suddenly she turned to him as she was about to pass on, and said in a low voice, "'I'll go for a walk with you, if you like. You just go on, and I'll follow in a minute.' For a moment he looked steadily at her. He saw that the first glance had misled him. Her face was not flushed with drink as he had supposed.' but it was radiant with the most exquisite color. A red flame glowed and died on her cheek, and seemed to palpitate as she spoke. The head was set on the neck nobly, as in a statue, and about the ears the bronze hair strayed into little curls. She was smiling and waiting for his answer. 
He muttered something about being very sorry and fled down the hill out of the orgy, from the noise of roaring voices and the glitter of the great lamps very slowly swinging in the blast of wind. He knew that he had touched the brink of utter desolation. There was death in the woman's face, and she had indeed summoned him to the Sabbath. Somehow he had been able to refuse on the instant, but if he had delayed, he knew he would have abandoned himself to her body and soul. He locked himself in his room and lay trembling on the bed, wondering if some subtle sympathy had shown the woman her perfect companion. He looked in the glass, not expecting now to see certain visible and outward signs, but searching for the meaning of that strange glance that lit up his eyes. He had grown even thinner than before in the last few months, and his cheeks were wasted with hunger and sorrow, but there were still about his features the suggestion of a curious classic grace, and the look as of a fawn who has strayed from the vineyards and olive gardens. He had broken away, but now he felt the mesh of her net about him, a desire for her that was a madness, as if she held every nerve in his body and drew him to her, to her mystic world, to the rose-bush where every flower was aflame. He dreamed all night of the perilous things he had refused, and it was lost to awake in the morning, pain to return to the world. The frost had broken and the fog had rolled away, and the gray street was filled with a clear gray light. Again he looked out on the long dull sweep of the monotonous houses, hidden for the past weeks by a curtain of mist. Heavy rain had fallen in the night, and the garden rails were still dripping, the roof still dark with wet, all down the line the dingy white blinds were drawn in the upper windows. Not a soul walked the street. Everyone was asleep after the exertions of the night before. Even on the main road it was only at intervals that some straggler paddled by. Presently a woman in a brown ulster shuffled off on some errand. Then a man in shirt-sleeves poked out his head, holding the door half open, and stared up at a window opposite. After a few minutes he slunk in again and three loafers came slouching down the street, eager for mischief or beastliness of some sort. They chose a house that seemed rather smarter than the rest, and irritated by the neat curtains, the little grass plot with its dwarf shrub, one of the ruffians drew out a piece of chalk and wrote some words on the front door. His friends kept watch for him, and, the adventure achieved, all three bolted, bellowing Yahoo laughter. Then a bell began, tang, 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 and here and there children appeared on their way to Sunday school, and the chapel teachers went by with virtuous eyes and lips, scowling at the little boy who cried, Piper! Piper! On the main road, many respectable people, the men shining and ill-fitted, the women hideously bedizened, passed in the direction of the independent nightmare the stuccoed thing with the Doric columns, but on the whole life was stagnant. Presently Lucian smelt the horrid fumes of roast beef and cabbage. The early risers were preparing the one o'clock meal, but many lay in bed and put off dinner till three, with the effect of prolonging the cabbage atmosphere into the late afternoon. A drizzly rain began as the people were coming out of church, and the mothers of little boys in velvet and little girls in foolishness of every kind were impelled to slap their offspring and to threaten them with father. Then the torpor of beef and beer and cabbage settled down on the street. In some houses they snorted and read the parish magazine. In some they snored and read the murders and collected filth of the week but the only movement of the afternoon was a second procession of children, now bloated and distended with food, again answering the summons of tang-tang-tang. On the main road the trams, laden with impossible people, went humming to and fro, and young men who wore bright blue ties cheerfully haw-hawed and smoked penny cigars. They annoyed the shiny and respectable and verjuiced lipped but not by the frightful stench of the cigars, but because they were cheerful on Sunday. 
By and by, the children, having heard about Moses in the bulrushes and Daniel in the lion's den, came straggling home in an evil humor. And all the day it was as if on a gray sheet gray shadows flickered, passing by. And in the rose garden every flower was aflame. He thought in symbols, using the Persian imagery of a dusky court, surrounded by white cloisters, gilded by gates of bronze. The stars came out, the sky glowed a darker violet, but the cloistered wall, the fantastic trellises in stone, shone whiter. It was like a hedge of may-blossom, like a lily within a cup of lapis lazuli, like sea-foam tossed on the heaving sea at dawn. Always those white cloisters trembled with the lute-music, always the garden sang with the clear fountain, rising and falling in the mysterious dusk. And there was a singing voice stealing through the white lattices and the bronze gates, a soft voice chanting of the lover and the beloved, of the vineyard, of the gate and the way. Oh, the language was unknown, but the music of the refrain returned again and again, swelling and trembling through the white nets of the latticed cloisters, and every rose in the dusky air was aflame. He had seen the life which he expressed by these symbols offered to him, and he had refused it. And he was alone in the gray street, with its lamps just twinkling through the dreary twilight, the blast of a ribald chorus sounding from the main road, a doggerel hymn whining from some parlor to the accompaniment of the harmonium. He wondered why he had turned away from that woman who knew all secrets, in whose eyes were all the mysteries. He opened the desk of his bureau and was confronted by the heap and litter of papers, lying in confusion as he had left them. He knew that there was the motive of his refusal. He had been unwilling to abandon all hope of the work. The glory and the torment of his ambition glowed upon him as he looked at the manuscript. It seemed so pitiful that such a single desire should be thwarted. He was aware that if he chose to sit down now before the desk, he could, in a manner, write easily enough. He could produce a tale which would be formally well-constructed and certain of favorable reception. And it would not be the utterly commonplace, entirely hopeless favorite of the circulating library. It would stand in those ranks where the real thing is skillfully counterfeited, amongst the books which give the reader his orgy of emotions, and yet contrive to be superior and art in his opinion. Lucian had often observed this species of triumph and had noted the acclamation that never failed the clever sham. Romola, for example, had made the great host of the serious, the portentous, shout for joy, while the real book, the cloister and the hearth, was a comparative failure. He knew that he could write a Romola, but he thought the art of counterfeiting half-crowns less detestable than this shabby trick of imitating literature. He had refused definitely to enter the atelier of the gentleman who pleased his clients by ingeniously simulating the grain of walnut, and though he had seen the old oaken ambry kicked out contemptuously into the farmyard, serving perhaps the necessities of hens or pigs, he would not apprentice himself to the masters of veneer. He paced up and down the room, glancing now and again at his papers, and wondering if there were not hope for him. A great thing he could never do, but he had longed to do a true thing, to imagine sincere and genuine pages. He was stirred again to this fury for the work by the event of the evening before, by all that had passed through his mind since the melancholy dawn. The lurid picture of that fiery street, the flaming shops and flaming glances, all its wonders and horrors, lit by the naphtha flares and by the burning souls, had possessed him. And the noises, the shriek and the whisper, the jangling rattle of the piano organ, the long-continued scream of the butcher as he dabbled in the blood, the lewd litany of the singers, 
these seemed to be resolved into an infernal overture, loud with the expectation of lust and death. And how the spectacle was set in the cloud of dark night, a phantom play acted on that fiery stage, beneath those hideous brassy lamps, very slowly swinging in a violent blast. As all the medley of outrageous sights and sounds now fused themselves within his brain into one clear impression, it seemed that he had indeed witnessed and acted in a drama, that all the scene had been prepared and vested for him, and that the choric songs he had heard were but preludes to a greater act. For in that woman was the consummation and catastrophe of it all, and the whole stage waited for their meeting. He fancied that after this the voices and the lights died away, that the crowd sank swiftly into the darkness, and that the street was at once denuded of the great lamps and of all its awful scenic apparatus. Again, he thought, the same mystery would be represented before him. Suddenly, on some dark and gloomy night, as he wandered lonely on a deserted road, the wind hurrying before him, suddenly a turn would bring him again upon the fiery stage, and the antique drama would be reenacted. He would be drawn to the same place, to find that woman still standing there. Again he would watch the rose radiant and palpitating upon her cheek, the argent gleam in her brown eyes, the bronze curls gilding the white splendor of her neck and for the second time she would freely offer herself. He could hear the wail of the singers swelling to a shriek, and see the dusky dancers whirling round in a faster frenzy, and the naphtha flares tinged with red as the woman and he went away into the dark, into the cloistered court where every flower was aflame, whence he would never come out. His only escape was in the desk, he might find salvation if he could again hide his heart in the heap and litter of papers, and again be wrapped by the cadence of a phrase. He threw open his window and looked out on the dim world and the glimmering amber lights. He resolved that he would rise early in the morning and seek once more for his true life in the work. But there was a strange thing. There was a little bottle on the mantelpiece— a bottle of dark blue glass, and he trembled and shuddered before it as if it were a fetish. End of chapter 6